This Thanks conference for... will now be recorded. Thanks for inviting me uh, this evening. I hope you can see my slides. I tried sharing them while you were doing that introduction there. Can you just uh, somebody just say if you can see them? Yes, I can see them fine. Brilliant. So, sorry, Thank just, you. just before we go any further, just a, a note, note that's been recorded. I thought that we discussed last week it wasn't going to be recorded. Is that not what we agreed, Mark? Unless you're, you're of course, happy to, to go ahead. I'm, I'm happy for the main presentation to be recorded. I think we said we'd probably um, stop at the questioning. Right. That's right. OK. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to uh, talk this evening on uh, track worker safety in the um, investigations that we've done and also um, uh, supporting uh, a few case studies with a bit of uh, academic research that I've done uh, as part of my visiting professor role that uh, Tim just mentioned there. I did want to just give um, a little bit of a sort of health warning, for want of a better word, before I start. Um, I'm going to go through a number of our case studies, as um, as uh, you probably expected, um, with a, a presentation from the RAIB. Um, so just to uh, uh, allay any sort of concerns or sensitivities, obviously I will be talking about some near misses and um, some fatalities. So um, please do be aware of that. And um, obviously, if there's any concerns around that, I have no um, uh, no offence will be taken if you wanted to to step out at, uh, uh, for that. So. Um, just to start off with, though, before I go into those um, case studies, a little bit about the REIB, in case you're not familiar with our work. Um, we are the independent accident investigation body for the UK Railway. The key word in that being the independent part. So we are independent of the industry. We're independent of the regulator, the ORR. We're independent of the police. Uh, we're not part of British Transport Police or anything like that. We're actually structurally part of the government. We're, we're an arm's length uh, body of the Department of Transport, but functionally we work independently even of, of them. So the, as far as paying rations are concerned, we are DFT, but um, to all intents and purposes, we are an independent body. And that independence is very important for us uh, in terms of our function of uh, improving safety on the railways. Our, our entire raison d'etre, if you like, is to improve railway safety. Nothing that we do is about blame or prosecution or anything like that. We uh, investigate accidents to a great level of detail and to the best of our ability in order to make recommendations that will really try and prevent them from happening again, purely to, to improve safety. We came about in, uh, we actually started our operational uh, uh, life in uh, 2005, October 2005, and uh, we were formed as a direct result of one of Lord Cullen's recommendations from the Ladbroke Grove disaster. So uh, during his uh, inquiry, uh, at that point in time, there was an independent air accidents investigation branch, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, based in, in Farnborough, just next door to uh, where I'm based at the, uh, the Farnborough uh, uh, office of the REIB. They've been around for about 100 years or so. Um, there was also a marine accident investigation branch. They're based in Southampton and they've been around since the late 80s. They were formed as a result of the Herald of Free Enterprise uh, disaster. But we didn't have at that point in time a, an independent rail accident investigation branch. Uh, so Lord Cullen made a recommendation that we should have one. And over the next uh, uh, five years or so, Acts of Parliament were laid down. Uh, regulations were put into place to uh, uh, bring us into being and to, uh, to govern our operation. Our scope includes um, serious accidents uh, involving moving trains. So the moving train is, is, is the big criteria in there. So we don't do, for instance, um, slip trips and falls at stations. Um, we don't do trespass and suicide. We just do things that are uh, accidental, uh, 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 sorry, accidents, if you like. Um, but we also do incidents that may have led to an accident. So um, one of the things that um, I quite often get asked when you tell people outside the industry what you do, um, you say, oh, well, I investigate rail accidents. Uh, people often always turn around and say, well, how many rail accidents are there? Then they're sort of quite surprised that there needs to be this kind of body. But uh, and unfortunately, of course, as, as you know, there are there are very few that actually result in um, serious consequence. Um, but uh, uh, but we do also investigate near miss incidents that under slightly different circumstances could have led to one of those more serious accidents because there's just as much safety learning in, in many cases to be had from those incidents um, as you would get out of a, a, an actual accident so it's just 
the one last barrier or sometimes even just pure chance that has prevented uh, an incident from becoming an actual uh, accident. And so to a large extent, those are what might be called the three lessons. Our main output is our reports, which are in the public domain. They're published on our website. So all of the case studies that I'm going to be talking about in a few moments, um, you can find further details of all of them on our website, which is out there on the, on the slide. So they're all in the public domain, all freely available. And our, our main um, product, if you like, is our safety recommendations, which always come towards the end of each of those reports um, based on the causal factors that we've identified as part of the investigation. A little bit more about our operation. Um, so we have two uh, operational bases. Um, you see uh, there on the slide, so one in Derby. And as I said, I'm based at the office uh, in Farnborough. Um, the picture is actually the one way around on that slide. I should change that. The one at the picture at the top is our Farnborough office and the one at the bottom is, is our Derby base. But in both, both places, you can see we've got an incident response vehicle. Um, at Derby, they also have a, a larger vehicle, the incident management vehicle, which goes to larger sites. For instance, it went up to Carmont for uh, several days uh, for the recent uh, disaster at uh, Stonehaven. Um, between the two offices, we have in total about 40 odd, mid 40s uh, in terms of number of staff, um, about half of which are inspectors. Um, so we've got 20, 22, 23 inspectors at the moment, they're about um, two teams in each uh, office, two teams of about four or five inspectors in, e in, each, uh, in each base. And we work on on-call roster that uh, runs from 8.30 Monday through to 8.30 the following Monday and each um, inspector is uh, rostered on-call on average about one week in three throughout the year. So it's 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, there will be at least two inspectors on call in uh, both Farnborough and, and Derby. And the geographical split there is to try and uh, give us coverage. You can see our, our um, uh, geographical scope there in, in orange. So we cover all of GB, Northern Ireland and half of the Channel Tunnel. Uh, you can see on the slide there, we cooperate with our French counterparts on Channel Tunnel investigations. And there have been a few of those in the years of our operation. Um, I think it's about four or five now, uh, Channel Tunnel investigations. And we have, um, uh, inspectors have uh, investigatory powers under the Railways Transport Safety Act 2003. So there's various powers, I won't go into them in great detail, but uh, entering railway property, um, interviewing witnesses, taking statements, that, that kind of thing. And the witness interviews is, is quite a key part of it. So going back to that point about independence, um, when we when we interview witnesses as part of an investigation, we do emphasize that independence and, we, and, and one of the regulations that covers our operation actually um, provides witnesses with anonymity. So we, we, we actually cannot, by law, reveal um, uh, what witnesses, uh, witness statements to other bodies. Um, so for instance, we can't pass on a witness statement to the police or the regulator or anything like that. And the idea of that is to hopefully allow people to be open and honest with us um, when, uh, when we talk to them about what's happened. Because as I say, we're just about safety learning. Whatever's happened, if they've got um, a, a certain issue that they might not want to discuss with, their employer or their police for whatever reason, um, then hopefully they can discuss it with us so we can get the safety learning out of it. So I've mentioned our geographical scope. Um, in terms of our, uh, you know, what, what we investigate, um, as I say, it involves moving trains and we cover both uh, mainline, um, light rail, metro, underground, um, passenger and freight and heritage railways. So uh, across the board there, we've got uh, various examples, a picture on the far left, um, which uh, of course up until very recently was one of the biggest um, accidents we've, uh, we've investigated. That's the derailment and accident at Grey Rig back in 2007. Picture in the middle there is a London Underground train at Marl End, which derailed uh, in a tunnel. Um, top right is an image of a freight train that derailed at, at Carbridge. Um, uh, in under sort of where well, you can see the conditions there. I don't need to explain that. And then on the bottom right, you probably recognise the, um, the the Croydon tram uh, uh, disaster uh, back in uh, 2016. Um, so covering the entire uh, range of the, or I haven't got a picture of there, is, is, is heritage. And as I say, they they, they we we cover any accident that involves a moving train, and the railways that we cover 
uh, is uh, again the, 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 the sort of main criterion for scope there is uh, any railway that that crosses a public highway so whether that's at grade or, or, or over or under bridge um, so we wouldn't do for instance um, a miniature railway in a fun fair or, or um, you know garden railways that that kind of thing nor would we do railways that are solely in um, industrial curtilage so things in factories quarries most sidings etc cetera, etc cetera. So that's a little bit about us and, and why we exist. I hope that's given you a bit of background if you weren't already aware. I'll move on now, um, as promised, to talk about um, some of the investigation case studies that we've covered over the years. I will only spend a few minutes on each one, conscious um, that uh, I could probably go on all night with, 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 with these, but by all means, um, uh, do follow up with our reports if you're interested in further detail on each one of them, or we can talk about them in more detail during the questions later. <clears throat> So this first one then, um, one of the um, first track work investigations I got involved with when I joined the branch actually a number of years ago. Um, this is a, a near miss which involved a group of track workers uh, at Hess Bank up in Cumbria back in 2014. Um, the picture I've got there is a video which I'll run in a second. Hopefully it'll come through okay, but just a bit of context. So what we've got here is a group of about, I think it's about eight or nine track workers, if I remember rightly, uh, working um, on an overbridge, a uh, rail, rail over, um, I believe it's a waterway underneath, but uh, but they're actually working just after um, a, a road over rail bridge, um, and they're working under lookout protection when the lookout's using a lookout operated warning system, the Lowe's system. So um, when I run the video, you can just about see it in that image there. Actually, our lookout is just standing under that level crossing bridge. Uh, there and he's got a, a, a radio pack, essentially a radio system, uh, a pack around his neck. Um, and uh, when the train approaches, the idea is that he, he flicks a switch to put a warning on, which then uh, communicates with a, a base station at the at the site of work. Bells and whistles sound, and um, and the group get off track uh, in good time for the train to come through. I'll run the video and actually show you what happened. I hope this um, comes through okay. So as we go under the bridge, you can see the lookout in the orange there, of course, on the left hand side about a mile or so um, from the work site as the train rounds the curve. And you can see why they've got such um, such a need for this there. It's quite a curvy section of line up there. Go under this first bridge. And as, as we go into this second bridge here, you'll see the gang of, of, of track workers um, just there. And you can see how close that is. I mean, that's that's um, when when we saw that when it first came through, uh, it was it was obviously pretty shocking. They had a about two seconds at best, I think, of sighting um, as that train came through. In actual fact, the, 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 the cause in that case was uh, the controller site safety was was working in the forefoot, facing traffic. Obviously, good good practice to do so. And they they saw the the train as it came under the bridge and, and shouted a warning to to his colleagues to get off the track. Um, <clears throat> as I said, I won't go into great detail uh, uh, about any of these, but um, in, in a nutshell, what happened here was um, uh, that the, the, we, we tested the lookout equipment and everything else, that, the, the, the Lowe's um, equipment, that was all working fine. So what this came down to was the lookout not actually putting the warning on for the, for the gang at the work site. And um, when we got into this in a bit more detail, it's, it's, it, on the face of that, it would seem very easy to maybe sort of blame the lookout and say, you know, well, uh, look out human error there um, not not putting the warning on that's where I got involved with this my interest in human factors I say well this it's, it's never as simple as just a, a human error there's, there's there's no such thing there's always context there's always a reason behind it um, and what we think happened in this case I don't know how familiar um, people are with the with the low system um, I think it tends to be used a bit more um, in, in northern regions um, but the, the kind of system that, that he was using, there's, there's, there's a few variants. Um, there's a, a, um, the actual uh, warning switch, which is a sort of pair of uh, switches in, in opposing directions, which actually puts the warning on for the train. But there's also a vigilance switch, which is exactly the same design of the, the warning switches. So it's a spring loaded sort of thing. Every 20 seconds, the lookout needs to flick that switch just to say that they're still alive and 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 well, it says vigilance, but this is one of my human factors things. It, it, it doesn't really um, monitor vigilance in, in, in the genuine sense that are you vigilant? Are you actually looking out for trains? It just really says my thumb is working and I'm flicking this switch. So I'm, I'm standing up, I'm, I'm breathing, not much more than that. And we believe, we couldn't prove this because there's no data logging on the, the lookouts um, part of that equipment. 
but what we believe happened in this case was um, the, the lookout effectively um, got the switches confused and operated the vigilance switch rather than the, the, the train warning switch, if you like. A again, we wouldn't want to stop there and just say, well, silly mistake, getting the switches confused, um, because um, again, I, I mentioned already, they're all they were a very similar design, um, so that the, the switches themselves feel very similar. Um, in this case, um, there was a time on task effect. The lookout had been working for coming up for two hours without a break in this. And there's all sorts of context behind that, which I haven't got time to go into uh, right now. But in that period, because of this 20 second um, uh, time uh, timer on the on the vigilance switch, we worked out that that meant the, the lookout had operated the vigilance switch about 380 times, or at least 380 times in that time period. So it almost become a, an automatic sort of habitual reaction to do that. Now associated with that is again thinking about human factors research that is, goes back decades actually. We've known that there's something called a vigilance decrement for some time now. In as much as this kind of task which involves vigilant monitoring, so you're looking out for um, a, a, what is essentially a signal, not 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 a train signal, but a, you know a, a stimulus. I use the word signal because the, the original research on this goes back to radar operators in the Second World War looking for blips on a radar screen, so looking for sort of signals on a screen. Um, so, but when you're looking for sort of low frequency uh, uh, signals, uh, like like looking out for a train, um, our performance on that kind of task. Uh, cannot be maintained for any great length of time. In actual fact, it starts to degrade after only about 20 or 30 minutes. And as I said, this chap had been on this task for coming up for two hours. And that's not uncommon in the rail industry, as I'm sure you know. But it's not conducive to maintaining that level of monitoring over time. So that coupled with the issue with the design of the switch and this fact that he'd been doing this hundreds of times over the course of that particular um, uh, working period, not just the shift, but just that working period since lunch. There was also a factor associated with what we term prospective memory. So although sighting at the actual site of work, so because of the curves on the track that you saw in the video there, wasn't very good, where the lookout was stood, he actually had quite good sighting up the line. It, it straightened out there and there was quite good sighting. And he was quite conscious that um, although the rule book says you should put a warning on as soon as you see a train, if he'd done that, the train would then take some time to pass him and then a bit of further time to pass the, the work group. And so they could be standing down for quite an excessive amount of time, actually. So conscious of that, um, he'd uh, uh, developed a, 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 um, a, an idea of where, you know, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll think of a marker. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing here, of course, I'm not, not divulging exactly what, what, what happened, of course, for obvious reasons that I mentioned earlier. But as, a, as an example, when the train passes that bridge there, that's when I will put the warning on, if you get what I'm, if you get what I'm saying. But what that invokes then is this, this idea of prospective mem memory, which means remembering to remember. So I need to remember when the train gets to that bridge to put on the warning. And what, again, we think happened, none of it, this is all just based on the best evidence we could get, is between the train first coming into view for the lookout and then passing that point, that marker point, whatever he had in his mind, the vigilance um, uh, uh, switch had to be activated because of the 20 second timer. And that pro probably ov overrode his, this, this prospective memory thing. So that, that gave him the, the cue that he thought he'd actually put the warning on when as an actual fact, he'd, put the, he'd actually use the vigilance switch. So those are the sort of main causal factors. If you're familiar with the structure of our report, so the, the bullet points on the slide there, which I've done for all of these case studies, I've got a few causal factors, which are the more sort of direct causal factors, and then underlying factors associated with the more sort of organisational level things that are going on. So in this case, um, Network Rail had done a bunch of research into the lookout role. This is relatively well-known stuff about vigilance and, uh, and everything else, um, which hadn't necessarily translated into... Uh, uh, changes for the task on the ground, etc. And also in this case, with, with the Lowe's lookouts, that actually introduces a single point of failure. So if you can imagine, it, rather than the Lowe's lookout here, if you'd imagine a chain of distant lookouts, you've got, if, if one lookout misses that, it's going to go to the next one and then maybe to the site lookout. So in actual fact, there's a couple of chances to, to, to catch that train, if you're not, not catch the train, I'm using the wrong word there, but you know what I mean, to, to, to actually um, spot that train. Um, OK, you might have a, a, a decreased safety margin in, in as much as you're not maybe getting your full 10 seconds to get off site, off, 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 of, off of track. 
But in this case, if, if the Lowe's lookout misses it, there is no intermediate. There's no chance of actually picking that up before it then gets to the site of work. And as you saw in this particular case, rounding that curve under that bridge gave them very little sighting. <clears throat> I'll move on to talk about um, oops, the next one, which is one that um, uh, I, I worked on myself. So this is another uh, a couple of near misses at, at Camden South, um, uh, just on the way into Euston back in February 2017. It's quite an interesting one. So there are actually two near misses here. So this is um, in the early hours of the morning, about one o'clock in the morning. It's the last train of the night coming into Euston. Um, coming in down that approach there that you can see in the picture, line A at Euston. Um, and uh, at the time, a couple of um, possession support staff, so block roadmen uh, in, the, in the colloquial sense, were um, going out to put out their um, uh, protection, their signs and detonators for the um, uh, night's possession that was coming up. And uh, and the train was approaching, the train came through, uh, about 47 miles an hour was coming through for the first one, um, and the, the, the first um, uh, possession support operative uh, uh, saw the train coming and, and stepped off tracking, so that's where we are in the picture there. Um, so you've got a fair amount of space to get off track, but um, obviously in an undesirable situation. So we had that near miss, and then they stopped, the train stopped for a bit, um, discussed the situation, reported it, et cetera, et cetera, and then moved on and then had a second near miss with the second um, block roadman putting out the uh, signs and debts at the other end. Um, in, in, in this case, because the train hadn't really got up to a great speed, it got up to about 24 miles an hour between the two, um, the train managed to stop short of, of, of that uh, uh, possession support staff, um, which was a good thing because they were on an overbridge at that point as well with limited clearance, so um, they wouldn't have had quite such a good chance of getting out of the way. And what happened here was um, uh, all at the signaler's end, actually. So um, this was to do with information management in the in the setup and implementation of the possession. A lot of this came down to the paperwork that the signaler used um, in, in the one, the weekly operating notice, and how that was translated into um, the, the, the actions that the signaler did to uh, in, ensure that the, 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 the roads were blocked uh, appropriately. So it's quite a complicated um, uh, a set of blockages going on for this for this possession over, over the night and um, I haven't got an image in here there's an image in the report um, of the, uh, the, the the block of text that the signaler was using because in this case there was a, a, a string of text literally just uh, you're probably familiar with the format of ones and it is just a string of largely unformatted text so and this went on for about seven or eight lines of, of, of various blocking points etc that the signal had to do and then at the very bottom of that list standing out on its own was, was line A between these two points. And because it was at the bottom there, because it was at the end of this long list, it simply got missed in, in, in um, when the signaler was setting this up, when the signaler was um, uh, uh, putting the protection out on the, uh, on the panel. So although um, he had a conversation with the PICOP and agreed all this, um, verbal comms were not the best either, but they'd agreed all of this, run through all the blocking points, et cetera, et cetera. Having done that, the signaler then signaled this train through on line A, where the uh, uh, the bike had just told the possession support people to go and put their um, signs and debts out. There was a possible fatigue factor as well with the signaler. He's on his second night shift um, and hadn't had a great deal of sleep. So um, he had the weekend essentially off, but had gone to a union conference. Um, so he was away for the weekend in hotel. So sleeping, you know, a normal sort of nightly sleep pattern. Gets up Monday morning, stays awake during the day on Monday, does the first night shift on Monday night, which in itself is not ideal because they had no daytime sleep. They effectively got up in the morning, then working right through to the next morning, which isn't ideal. Had about five and a half hours sleep in the daytime on Tuesday before this night shift. So this was a Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. So over the course of the last best part of the last two days, they've had only sort of five or six hours sleep, um, uh, which is a, a, a way below what's the recommended sort of seven, eight hours uh, a night or, or per 24 hour period, if you like. So there was a possible fatigue factor kicking in there for the signaler. And then again, looking at those underlying factors, we looked at the processes for managing the information around possessions, particularly in large, so this is um, uh, Wembley Mainline um, Signaling Control Centre, relatively large signal control centre, multi-panel box, um, there's a workstation in there as well, um, and the processes that, that refer to um, entering uh, uh, um, uh, blocking points in the train register, etc. they've kind of been adapted. There was a 
T3 book in the signal box instead of the train register they were using. And, and really, um, again, our details are more in the report, um, but the process are not, not necessarily fit for purpose for that kind of scenario. And then you've also got the process around setting up these kind of possessions. The mere need to have possession support staff to actually go out on track, essentially exposing themselves to risks um, when there's uh, uh, technological solutions that, um, uh, that that could have been used in, in this area. They were um, uh, uh, lockout devices on the signals that they could have been using that were uh, uh, effectively not used. Um, next one I'm going to talk about, I'm keeping an eye on the clock because I might not do all of these depending on how we're going for time, but um, next one I'll talk about is, is the, the near miss at Egmonton um, that occurred. Uh, again, a few years ago, um, and this was uh, again a, a, a gang of um, again about eight or nine um, uh, uh, staff, contract staff actually working with a network rail um, control of site safety, um, and that is an issue which I'll come back to uh, in a moment. Um, uh, so this is near Newark, um, and we've got a 125 mile an hour train going through on the down main here, um, uh, and there's a, a site. And again, I've got a bit of a video here. It's not. Um, the best video, what we've done here is actually stitched together a bunch of, of still photos into like a sort of montage. So um, apologies, it's not quite as smooth as, as, as actually just seeing a, a forward facing CCTV recording from the train. But if I run that through and you can see uh, what's actually happened here. So again, I've tried to do it about the sort of speed of, 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 of the train. So it gives you a sense of, of what's going on. You can see the gang there working just up near Edmonton level crossing there, um, just the far side of the level crossing. And again, We've got a second or so uh, of, of, of near miss there, so only about one or two seconds that, they, that the last person got off track before uh, the train went through. Um, main issues here were to do with the uh, setup of the safe system of work um, and the application of the safe system work by the COS uh, uh, in this case, which was um, uh, well out, outside of practice actually. Um, I, I hesitate to use the word non-compliance because um, uh, 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 there's usually all sorts of reasons behind that again from a human factors point of view. Uh, but in this case um, they were working outside of their safe system of work. Um, they'd worked on about three, two or three sites already that morning under various um, uh, uh, lookout protection systems. Actually in this area by the Edmonton level crossing they've got the track operating warning system, the tower system uh, in place which was on, they turned that on and it was operating but they were using it in a non-standard way um, because uh, of, uh, you can imagine that uh, tower sort of covers an, an area and any train striking in any if, e e uh, either end of that area will sound the alarm so regardless of where you are in that area where you're working, it might give you shorter or longer amounts of time. And because of that, they developed this, uh, well, COS had developed this unofficial uh, uh, method of working where when the tower's alarm sounded, that was a, almost like a cue for them to look out, to start looking out, um, to give them a bit of extra time. It gave them about 45 seconds extra time every time that a train came through and the COS was keen not to, not to lose that time. So as I say, the towers is almost like an informal cue for the lookout to start looking out. Um, and actually, by the time this occurred, there'd been a bit of confusion about who was the lookout, whether the lookout was meant to be involved with the work. And in fact, actually, you could probably just about make out on those images. At this point, nobody was actually doing the looking out. There was also some issues about relying on the uh, crossing barriers as well, relying on the good alarms for the crossing barriers. Um, and, it, and they were also doing a piece of work that wasn't actually on their safety system of work plan. Their, their, the work that they had planned was south of the crossing, but while they were there, the COS had spotted a bit of a, a poor top on the, uh, on the line just north of the crossing and decided to get that sorted out while they were there. It's almost incidental because you know, the, 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 the issues with the application of the safety system of work were the main uh, issue here. And again, you can see on the slide there, uh, one of the big causal factors was the fact that nobody challenged that. And that relates into one of the underlying factors about these relationships between, I mentioned it's network rail costs and actually zero hours contractors um, who were making up the rest of the gang. And there were all sorts of issues about willingness to challenge uh, because um, of, of a fear for losing the work effectively. You know, if you're a zero hours worker, you stand up to the cost, you don't come back for work the following week, well that's the, that's the perception and that was that was the sort of fear that was going on. And the other underlying factor there, the main one, was to do with the training of the, well I've said person in charge there under the, under the new parlance, um, control of site safety as you, as, you, as you like to call them, 
um, in the area of non-technical skills, and this is another human factors area, so non-technical skills covers things like safety leadership, safety behaviours, um, uh, that, that, that kind of thing, so communication, uh, team working, all that kind of thing, which was, uh, was clearly not happening here. Oops. Um, next one, um, I'm going to start whizzing through these because I want to talk a bit more about some, some research as well. This was in, in, in near Mr. South Hampstead, um, uh, near Primrose Hill, uh, again, uh, sort of north of London. Um, and uh, again, lots of sort of um, local uh, issues here. With In fact, the big issue here was with the application of the new um, 019 standard for the implementation of just mentioned person in charge on the last uh, case study. Um, and the understanding of the application of that standard and the, the role of the person in charge, etc. Fundamentally, what happened here was um, quite a large group. Um, in fact, they split into a couple of groups. Um, and the cause at this location had uh, effectively mi mixed up the uh, the lines that were closed and the lines that were open. So the, the, the clue is in the slide there. So the slow lines on, on our right, as we're looking at that picture, were the ones that were blocked and they were the ones that they're meant to be working on. Uh, but the cause got that mixed up and thought they were working on the fast lines and um, told them to put trolleys down on the fast lines. And they were just in the process of doing that um, when a train came through um, and uh, it was doing about 50, 49 miles an hour, this train. And uh, they, because they split up, there was a group a bit further down, about 100 metres further down, who saw it coming, shouted a warning. They just managed to get the trolleys off, but one worker just sort of dived out of the way at the last minute and suffered a minor injury uh, in, in the process. But again, this is all to do with the ineffective safety arrangements. The, the, the fact that there wasn't actually um, a designated person in charge on, on this uh, on this site for this uh, for this group, um, because of confusion about that role, where that where that person was supposed to be. They, 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 yeah, the standard says they're supposed to be on site with them, but they weren't. They also had um, about three causes, uh, uh, with like one designated as like a lead cause, which is is completely. Um, uh, sort of unofficial uh, way of working um, and, and so no processes for uh, uh, managing that either. Um, there was some issue with the, uh, the cause's familiarity with the location, they weren't familiar with it so this that, that, that led to this mix-up um, and uh, no indication at the access point and we've come across this before in previous investigations about the, the signage at access points uh, you know those blue signs that you get um, the clarity of uh, the, the you know um, uh, which line is which and uh, and and where you uh, where you need to work where, where you are in relation to um, uh, the actual geography on the ground if you like but again the main point here was really the, the clarity of the of the latest issue of network rail standard 019 with respect to the person in charge their, their role in planning and delivering the work and supervising work groups etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, this is an incident at, at Peterborough um, a couple of years ago now um, to do with distant lookouts, flag lookouts. Um, so rather than the one at Hesbank where they're using Lowe's lookout, um, this uh, occurred. So we've got a, a 100 mile an hour train, uh, a class 90 DVT leading. Um, and I haven't got a video for this one, but this was a two and a half second near miss. So you can see the lookout in the image there just getting off, or, uh, off of the track that the train's on about two and a half seconds before it came through. And this came down to confusion over distant lookouts. So you can see the, the, the cause actually just in the set there working on, on a cabinet. Um, and just sort of behind us and to the uh, right and the other side of the railway is uh, from where the, the, the image is uh, uh, taken there. Um, they've got the distant lookout set up. But where they were stood, there was another distant lookout at the same time. So this was like a, a regular place that distant lookout stood at, at Peterborough and had, there were two or three gangs going on different, doing different pieces of work at the time. So um, <clears throat> they'd sent their distant lookout over there. Uh, he, he stood there. Um, and of course, from, from the point of view of the people on the ground looking over there, they're not quite sure which one's which. They'd come to an agreement that, well, whichever one flags will, will get off. But then a bit later in the work, and I'm cutting a long story short here, so forgive me. Um, the distant lookout, their, their distant lookout, um, believed he saw um, what it, what was interpreted as a, as a flag signal from the, the, the site lookout, 
which was again an informal practice that they'd been established at, 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 um, at the Peterborough location to say we, we finished work now you can stand down so they're not allowed to use phones etc so they developed this informal means of holding a flag across their body to say we're done yeah you can stand down so their distant lookout uh, thought he'd seen that but it, it would actually have been misinterpreted it wasn't the signal to stand down so he disappeared but of course there was another distant lookout for a different gang working in the opposite direction who was still there so when this train came through they didn't get a, a, a flag for that one so um, that was part of the reason that was going uh, that was behind this one another reason was that the uh, the site lookout uh, himself had got uh, rather distracted rather got involved with the work um, they tended to be uh, following the cross around they were trying to learn on the job uh, following the cross around finding out what they were doing and at the time of the incident um, they were actually stood in the forefoot uh, looking down at, at, at the forefoot um, there was a, an account of having dropped their keys but there was possibly something else going on there as well so that's how they weren't necessarily attending to seeing the train coming through either um, underlying factors on this one were to do with the planning as you can see on the slide there so again this is something that's come up number of times in our investigations where they default to the lowest level of the safety harm like i said defaulting down straight to uh, uh red zone with uh, or sorry planning open line with with, with lookout um, rather than stepping through the hierarchy from top down as as, as they should and these rules about um, communication between site and distant, look, distant lookouts these effectively impractical so not not accounting for what people really do and what people really need to do on the ground so all these rules about not being able to use phones etc etc but that really provides a barrier to work on the ground so how how would you otherwise communicate between a site lookout and a distant lookout in that kind of situation and that's how they'd come to develop these informal rules about flags etc Uh, I'll move on and quickly cover um, Stokes Nest. Um, this is a fatality. Um, you might be familiar with it's a bit closer to home. Um, so this was um, a, again a possession support assistant who was going to put um, uh, uh, boards and debts out for a forthcoming possession. I don't know if you can see my pointer on screen there, but where we've got this image here, they'd come on an access point here, uh, gone to lay the protection at the signal gantry, you can just about to see there, and then come back um, past the uh, access point outside of the protection limit so there was a crossover I can't quite see it on the picture myself um, there was a crossover that marked the end of the protection limits they'd walk past that and we believe they were walking towards one of the, the sets of tablets down here to um, it might have been these ones actually oops, oops excuse me um, uh, because they were trying to um, uh, uh, increase one of the competencies on their on their um, on their card um, to learn more about them um, so they're walking down here back to traffic um, and then a train came over um, and uh, it did blow its horn and the, the track worker acknowledged, carried on walking back to traffic, train blew its horn again, again there was an acknowledgement but um, which led us to conclude that um, the, 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 the track worker in this case probably believed that um, they weren't in an exposed location, probably believed that a train wouldn't approach them on their line, whether or not they thought they were still inside the protection or whether they just thought nothing would approach on on that particular line, uh, we'll never know. But um, the fact that they acknowledged and auto, you know almost automatically kept on walking in the forefoot, despite the fact there is a very wide uh, assess here that, um, that that could have been used. Probably also fatigued and probably also distracted. So they should have had a possession support assistant with them um, because this is third rail area. There should be two people working <coughs> at this location. Um, and in this case, um, as, as it happens, that was um, meant to be his brother. Um, but because, again, these are zero hours contractors, they, uh, he was working a second job um, to supplement his income and uh, was, was very tired on that day. Um, and uh, consequently um, asked his brother to cover for him on, 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 on this job. Um, so he's down there working uh, without an assistant. That probably caused some distraction. And the, the, the um, possession support staff himself, the, 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 the person who was unfortunately involved in this incident, um, was also probably quite fatigued as well for, for similar reasons. I've been up that morning doing, doing um, uh, work in, in, during the day, not, not, not paid work, decorating work around, uh, around a, a friend's house. So underlying issues here around fatigue management and uh, management of zero hours contractors. So in, in both senses there, so fatigue management of zero hours contractors, but also 
management of those, management of this, what they what they term the industry ghosting problem. So the fact that people aren't turning up as position support assistants um, and getting people to, to cover for them. And again, to do with the sort of zero hours culture. And again, this issue of just the very need for having people out on the track, exposing themselves to risk, putting out boards and debts um, in, the, in the modern era. The last one, um, uh, only because um, when when um, I was originally invited to uh, present, we were talking about uh, Margam. As, as as you know, that um, oh, as, as I expect you know that report has not been completed yet, so um, I can't talk in any great detail about the double fatality at Margam that happened last July. Um, but I just to mention it uh, because I think there was an expectation that I would cover this uh, today. Um, but so just a few uh, factual details from the interim report, um, really. So this was a, a, a case of, of unfortunate uh, two track workers who were struck and fatally injured just uh, uh, just near Margam in South Wales. And again, here we've got a case of people working on an open line without formally appointed lookouts. There was a third track worker in the same group who um, just got out of the way in time and uh, uh, was obviously very distressed, but um, got away without uh, physical injury. Again, we know, and this was published in the interim report, they were using noisy power tools uh, at the time, probably using air defenders too. That may have affected their um, perception of the uh, the train coming through and the perception of the warning horn. And the investigation itself um, has been looking at. So again, this, is, this was published in the interim report as the scope that the investigation would do, but of course, a lot of that has been completed, but we haven't yet um, published. So just to say that it has been looking at, again, group dynamics between obviously people in the work group, planning of the work, uh, working practices, uh, management assurance and organisational culture, and, and also there's some work on audibility in there as well to do with the, the warning horn with the ear defenders. So apologies, I can't go into great more detail about, about the Margam um, accident, but um, do um, keep your eye on our website um, uh, 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 over the next uh, uh, well, near future, I would say, um, and, and that report should be uh, published um, in due course. So I'll move on um, and talk now about some uh, research, which, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I sort of get involved with some of this stuff, partly through my sort of academic um, background uh, and colleagues who in the Human Factors Network who, who um, I'm, I'm still in touch with and work in this area. And a couple of years, actually just last year, um, it, it came out but over the last couple of years, I've been working with a colleague of mine in um, in Australia, uh, Dr. Andrew, or Professor Andrew Naweed, I should say, um, who um, approached me to talk to, to look at um, some of the human factors, some of the more sort of deeper organisational factors that might affect some of these incidents that we've been talking about. And one of the reasons we started talking about this uh, between us and, and we were particularly interested in whether or not there was a particular factor that affects lookout related incidents, because it seemed to us just intuitively, just a sort of gut feel on, on the stuff that I'd seen through my experience at RAIB and the stuff that he was seeing in Australia, that a lot of these issues seem to involve lookout. So was there anything particular about lookout working and, and in, in many cases it was, it was the lookouts themselves who were actually getting struck or being involved in the incident um, th themselves. So we were, wanted to, to, to do a bit of a deep dive into some of the uh, investigation reports and try to understand whether or not there were any particular factors effect, affecting lookout working. One of the sources that we drew upon was um, the RERB's class investigation. I've not mentioned that so far, but 2017 we published a, a class investigation, which is kind of a sort of a, a wrap up of lots of different incidents um, together to uh, doing a similar sort of thing, trying to understand deeper factors that affect, in, in this case, the class investigation was about track worker safety outside possessions. And the graph on the slide there comes from that class investigation report. Um, and as you can see, um, just over a third of the incidents at that point involved uh, red zone working with unassisted lookouts. So that was, again, one of the basis for what um, Anjum and I did uh, in this uh, in this uh, research paper, which published um, in Theoretical Issues in the Ergonomic Science Journal, the, the full citation on the slide there. So we're interested in things like vigilance. I've mentioned that already, prospective memory. I talked about that with the Hester Bank in uh, incident. And things like training and competence and, and, and deeper organisational factors. Um, and my contribution to the paper was obviously looking at the RMIB reports, and there were 21 of those at the time we wrote the paper, um, and Andrew collected 10 reports from the uh, Australian equivalent, the ATSB uh, reports and, and local, equivalent, local equivalents. And what we drew from that, so we 
uh, did a factor analysis effectively um, and identified nine common causal factors um, associated with that. So the graph on the right there is straight out of the of the paper um, and the, the text on the left explains each of those factors in a bit more detail. So at the top there, the most prevalent factor there being the safe system work and that's to do with issues of planning the safe system work or the implementation of the safe system work. So was it planned appropriately in the first place? and whether or not it was planned appropriately, was it also implemented properly on the ground? What we termed movement dynamics was um, associated with whether people were either not moving to a place of safety, so the, the Stokes Nest incident there uh, is an example of that, so uh, not actually moving to a place of safety when a train's coming through, or in some cases, people were in a place of safety and then moving out of it. Um, there was an incident I've not covered today at uh, Red Hill a couple of years back where um, uh, 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 I think again it was a cost in that case who was um, had, had got off but then started walking up the line again with back to the train and because it wasn't a very good place of safety there, it was a steep embankment, um, he ended up walking rather too close to the line and, and, and got rather nastily clipped by the train as it went through. Group dynamics with uh, 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 talks about some of these already, but uh, that's a, a wrap-up term for things like the sort of local cultural factors, attitudes and behaviours, safety leadership, that kind of thing within the track worker group on site. Information, again I mentioned some of that with the Camden South incident, so whether that's paperwork or whether that's um, communications, whether that's uh, sighting on the ground, um, Task design to do with, uh, so again, the, the, the vigilance issue comes into that. So the fact that, you know, working for too long without a, 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 a break to reset the vigilance issue. Distraction, uh, Peterborough, again, there is an example of, of being distracted by things other than the lookout tasks. Knowledge, skills and training, that explains itself. You know, competence and uh, expertise to do the job. So the South Hampstead incident being an example there where the cost wasn't familiar with the location. Problems with the lookouts warnings, whether the lookouts uh, given a warning in the first place or whether that was too late or even sometimes too early. Um, so again, the Hess Bank is an example of that. Um, and habitual responses. Um, so uh, again, I'll revert to Stokes Nest there as an example of you know, automatically putting your hand up and then just sort of carrying on, uh, you know, acknowledging the train, um, but, uh, but uh, not moving to a place of safety because it, it just becomes, uh, it becomes habit. Breaking those down, uh, or well, not breaking them down further, sorry, I should say, grouping them further into sort of higher level factors. Um, we then uh, uh, clustered them according to uh, a sort of classic human factors uh, hierarchy of, of, um, of, of, of factors associated. So if I go from the bottom up on that diagram, so classically in human factors, you start to think about individual issues, what, what's affecting that, that, that person, if you like, at the center of the, of the job, of the task that's going on. Then you look just outside them at the tasks that they're doing, things to do with the job, environment, context, that kind of thing that directly affect them. Then you've got social factors, so other people that are involved, communication type issues. And then outside all of that, you've got organisational factors to do with uh, rules, processes, company. You can go even wider than that and look at regulatory issues, that, that kind of thing. So, and again, I won't... Um, uh, you, you can you can see on, on on the slide how they've grouped together. But for instance, things to do with the safe system or work planning uh, group into the organisational stuff. Um, I would I would throw things like the 019 issue with person person in charge, uh, things like that. We talked about with the case study at Southampton. I'd put those in there now as well. I don't think we included Southampton in this study because as we were writing the paper, that one hadn't actually been done. Um, social issues which inc would include things like those moving in and out of a place of safety, uh, the group dynamics, informal working practices, local cultural things, that, that kind of thing. Um, the task factors uh, break down into things like the information requirements, the task design, vigilance issues, again in their equipment that they're using. So I mentioned that with the Hess Bank one, so the, the actual equipment design being a factor in that one. Um, environment, um, you know, quite often people are working in the dark or the rain or, or that kind of thing, that can affect obviously people's decisions and behaviours as well, uh, and then distractions as well, whether that's a task-related distraction or a non-task-related distraction. And then we've got the individual factors. Again, I'm, I'm slightly repeating what we've already done, so forgive me, but it's just to sort of group them into, into, those, uh, into those areas. Um, so again, training, competence, non-technical non skills, again, there being a, a, a key one for, for track worker safety. And there's a lot of work, as I'm sure you're aware, in the rare industry at the moment on, on technical skills 
things to do with a warning, and things to do with habitual responding, which are down to the uh, down to the individual. And coming back to the original points of of, of why we got together in the first place to do this uh, uh, research and uh, looking at whether or not there's any issues that particularly affect lookouts. Um, in actual fact. We, we found that there wasn't. So uh, yes, there are multiple factors involved in a lot of these incidents, and multiple interacting factors, and that's that's no surprise to be as an accident investigator. That's what we always find in any investigation. It's never just there's no such thing as a root cause. There's no just no such thing as a human error. You know, it's, it's never as simple as that. There's lots of things going on, and it's not a simple linear chain of events in in in, in most cases either. You know, there's lots of multiple interacting uh, uh, factors and that was the case for all of these that we looked at uh, in, in this research um, but as I say uh, there was nothing that stood out of uh, uh, as, as saying okay this is all the stuff to do with lookouts and this is all the stuff to do with other track workers the, these factors are rather common to each of them so okay it, it wasn't proof of our, our original theory about what we were looking at but it, it, in many ways that's that's an important learning as well that, that, that these factors are common to all of track work and they're things to be aware of and things to uh, be looking out for uh, whether you know whether we're implementing the work or whether investigating something that's happened it's um, you know the, 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 these kind of factors and that reflects as well going back to the class investigation that I've already mentioned um, uh, and, and again that's as with all of our reports that's on our website so please if you're interested look into that one uh, as well but again just to extract a, a rather high level summary from that report um, of the common causal factors that uh, that that one found across the incidents that it uh, that it addressed so uh, again these are not, not uh, 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 you know, these are, these are familiar from from uh, the, the the research that I've just presented. So things like cause being distracted or preoccupied with the task in, in hand. Um, I can equally say that same of a uh, lookout or, or or other track workers really. So being distracted with the uh, the job at the expense of um, managing the safety of the uh, of of the task. Multiple locations and, and moving work sites. Um, that's that's a, a, a key risk that's quite difficult to manage. But um, in that case, it comes down to the safe systems of work not being appropriate for the location. Again, then, several years ago now, we did an investigation at Bullwell where it was a moving work site, um, and there were all sorts of siting issues where you know the safe system of work had been planned on a cyclical basis, but it wasn't appropriate for that uh, location because, in many cases, there was red zone prohibited areas where um, you couldn't physically see um, in, enough to look out for yourself. Cultural issues, I've mentioned things like lack of challenge, you know, challenging a, um, a, a cause if you think that uh, they're, they're working unsafely. So again, the South Hampstead one being a good example of that. Um, there was some challenge there, but um, but the cause overrode it. So, you know, that you think about things like invoking the work safe procedure, that kind of thing, whether there's a willingness to challenge and how that challenge is received. Um, there's, there's two sides to that, you know, it's, it's not just about feeling able to speak up it's then you know the cause of the person in charge accepting that challenge and thinking okay i, I will stop and think about this and um and, and you know we, we can talk through this and talk through your concern rather than just saying no i'm right you're wrong you know what i mean uh verbal communication that's a long-standing issue i mean a lot of um railway safety does depend on verbal comms as i'm sure you know um and a lot of things can go wrong, both in the transmission and the reception uh, ends of, of verbal communications. Again, the, in, in the incident at Camden South is uh, a good example of that when the signal and the pie cop were talking to set up the uh, set up the possession. Over familiarity um, can be an issue, so that can reduce your risk perception, increases your risk tolerance, if you like. So. I, again, I'd hesitate to use a word like complacency because that has all sorts of sort of blame connotations associated with it. But there are issues of, of risk perception sometimes. If you, um, I'm sure you know what it's like. You know, the more times you go out on track, the the less dangerous it feels. Uh, you know, whereas um, you know, I, I think it's important to uh, every time you go out think, okay, this is a dangerous place, and uh, we, we we need to be very aware of that. Likewise, or well, sorry, flip side of that is the unfamiliarity. So again, South Hampstead being an example there, I'm familiar with the location, just an experience with the job, which can cause um, issues. Um, things being changed from what's been planned. Um, and that's where, you know, I guess the, the human part of, of, of track work comes into play. So, you know, being able to adapt to circumstances and in many cases that, that, that can go well. I mean, to remember, I suppose it's a good, good time to uh, mention that, that uh, 
most of the time things things do go well and, and humans contribute to uh, or people involved do contribute to successful performance and it's only a few times that things do go wrong and we, we try to learn from those but um where things can ha have changed as i say sometimes you can adapt and, and work with that but uh, sometimes that can lead to issues as well it does introduce a vulnerability into the process downgraded in the protection obviously Rulebook says that, uh, or standards say that uh, if you're downgrading, you need to get authorization for that. And sometimes that happens without being authorized. Informal methods of work, and I've talked about several of those already, things like the flags at Peterborough, um, uh, the Egmonton example. Um, resource issues, um, so access points, you know, is, is the access point uh, properly accessible, signage, um, even down to the, the human resources, you know, is, have I got enough people in this team? Have I got the right people in this team? Clarity of the safe system will work, um, a lot of that down to the cost briefing as well. And again, distraction, whether that's at the cost end or the signaler end. So um, this is my final um, uh, slide, um, just to pick out some, uh, these aren't all the recommendations of all the examples I've talked about, but just to pick out some that are relevant to the issues I've been talking about. So from Hess Bank, we recommended a review of the working time limits of lookouts, that whole issue around vigilance and how long people are on task. Um, Reviewing uh, from Camden South talks about reviewing procession management processes uh, to reduce the need for staff to be on track. And I think we've made that recommendation once or twice now in, in, in our investigations. Uh, you know, this whole issue of, um, you know, exposing procession support staff to the risks of, of being on track when they're putting out uh, um, um, boards and debts. Egmonton led to a recommendation on strengthening safety leadership on site, the non-technical skills issues that I mentioned to do with that. <clears throat> South Hampstead led to a recommendation on clarifying the, standard, the, the new standard 019, um, as the network well recognised uh, there were issues there. Um, also in South Hampstead, one on improving the location information in safe systems to work, so better layout of, uh, sort of uh, visual information or, or geographic or map information in, in the safe system to work pack to, uh, to provide that information to causes on site. <laughs> couple from Peterborough, so one about reducing the amount of, of lookout working and again the exposure of people to lookout working because it is the highest risk uh, one in the hierarchy and, uh, and I've, I've paraphrased slightly with that second one there so understanding work has done this is a bit of a human factors type phrase so the, the idea that um, you know people in uh, in offices and headquarters write the rules and procedures and, that, and that's what they refer to as work as imagined that's that's this idealistic um, uh, notion of what people do um, out there but then there's a real world and, and, and people make adaptations people and again a lot of those adaptations go well and people generally speaking get the job done without um, without incident but understanding how that work is really done how people really implement procedures this whole notion is you know this whole um, issue with people using informal flag signals to communicate with each other because they've got no better way of doing it um, so we made a recommendation on trying to understand that and, and, and doing something about it as well uh, Stokes Nest, uh, big issue there with zero hours workers, so reviewing risk management associated with those, and then just one from the class investigation. Um, again, there are more in each of these recommendations I've just picked out, I've cherry picked some from these, um, improving the local knowledge of, of, of track work leaders. So uh, again, there are issues about uh, knowing the, the patch that you're, you're working on. Um, so that's me. I'm apologies if I maybe have run slightly over time, but um, um, I hope that was uh, hope that was interesting, and um, I can uh, uh, um, stay around to take some questions if if people have any. All right. Thank you very much, Mark.